Okay, let's, let's go ahead and pray and ask God to be with us. Lord, we know that apart from your blessing, this is a fruit, fruitless and vain exercise to try to preach in the power of the flesh. And so, Lord, I pray that it, this would not be the case. Lord, would you please minister to your congregation today? Minister to these beloved souls that you have set your love upon. Help me, Lord, to speak clearly and effectively. Speak through me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, I want to speak to you about six reasons that you should become a member of a church. And of course, this comes to my mind because just later on, after lunch, we're going to be spending time in a new member's class talking about what it means to be a committed member of a local church. Now, you might be wondering, Brian, why are you bringing this up? I mean, isn't it enough for us just to attend, to be sort of a casual attender in a church? Isn't that enough? And my answer is no, I don't think it is. I, I think the Bible and God is calling for something much deeper than a casual attendance. He's, causing, he's calling for us to be committed, formally committed to a local church to live our lives out with each other and see the gospel be propagated through the lives of that congregation. Now, let's say I'm not a good woodworker. I don't even have a saw. I have a handsaw, but I don't have a real, you know, electric saw at my garage. But let's say that I wanted to go out in my garage after church today and make a table, a coffee table for the living room. And so I'm out there taking these big boards and I'm cutting them down, making them into smaller boards to make the legs for the coffee table. And um, all of a sudden I get distracted and that saw goes over my little finger. And before I know it, blood is squirting everywhere. And I look down and my finger's missing. It's been cut off. <laughs> What, 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 how should I respond to that? <laughs> First of all, I'd, I'd respond by screaming, ah, <laughs> get to the hospital. But I mean, once I realized that my finger was gone, that would be a tragedy because I'm going to have to live the rest of my life without that member. I'm going to have to learn how to do things. I'm a banjo player. I, maybe I can't even play my banjo anymore because my finger's gone. But the, here's the thing. People are separated from local churches all the time and we don't consider that a tragedy. In our society today, we almost consider that normal. We think there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way things are. I think that we should consider that tragic. When somebody's just a free-floating Christian, without any roots, without any commitments to a local church, I, I think it's not only anti-biblical, but it's tragic because they are missing out, and that body of Christ is missing out, and all that it could be. Folks, we're a product of our culture. And what is our culture value? You look around at our culture today, ever since the late 1960s, we value things like anti-authoritarianism. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. We also value rugged individualism, right? We're in the good old U.S. of A. We're, we're individualists here. And those values permeate into the church. And if we're not careful, we start to reflect the values that are in the world, the ungodly, unregenerate world around us, rather than the God, the values that God has given to us in His Word. You know, becoming a committed member of a local church will be one of the most countercultural things that you'll ever do. Look at the world around us. By and large, the world around us is flighty and noncommittal. People in the world don't want to commit to things. I mean, back in the early 1960s, one out of 10 couples lived together, nine out of 10 couples married. You know what it is today? Seven out of 10 couples live together, three out of 10 couples are married. Now, why would that happen? Why, what, what has gone on in our society to cause such um, proliferation of cohabitation rather than marriage. Can I just suggest to you, this is my idea, I think people want the benefits of marriage without the responsibilities. They don't want to have to make the commitment, the lifelong commitment that through sickness and in health, for better or for worse, 
that they are going to be married and committed to that individual, whether that person ends up getting in an automobile accident and become a quadriplegic and the rest of their life they're going to have to serve them, they don't want to be tied down. They want to have their choices. They want to have their options. And that whole spirit of the age has rubbed off into the church where we want our options. We don't want to be tied down to one local church. We want to be free to hop around or to float around here. Or if there's an awesome new church down the road, we want to just run down there and be part of that church. We don't understand commitment to the local church because we don't see it in our culture around us. Now, some people wonder, well, why would anybody want to become a member of a local church? Um, and I would ask you the same question, why would any person get married today? Why not just live with somebody? A lot of people are making that choice. Why do some people get married? We have 30% of couples getting married. Why are they doing it? Um, it's a lot easier just to live together, isn't it? I mean, if things don't turn out the way you thought, if you're not happy anymore in that relationship, it's a lot easier just to walk away, fill up your suitcase with your clothes, get your car, and you're gone. And that's it. It's a lot easier than having to go through an expensive divorce. Why go through all the trouble of making vows and promises and formal commitments to that one individual? Why sign your name on that piece of paper? I've heard all of these arguments. It's just black ink on white paper. I mean, I'm committed in my heart. Why do we, why do we need to go through that whole process? God has called his people to make commitments, one of which is marriage, another one of which is to the local church. Um, if we are going to enjoy the benefits of being part of the body of Christ, then it stands to reason that we should assume the responsibilities of becoming part of the body of Christ. What do we call it when somebody wants the benefits of marriage without the responsibilities? What are they doing? Well, they're living. They're living together. You know, people used to call that living in sin. People, people scoff at that today. Do you know only 27% of the United States population disapproves of living with someone you're not married to? 27%. Back in 1960, it would have been more like 90%. So we've done a total flip-flop. But we regard our involvement with a local church kind of like just moving in and living together, enjoying the benefits of the relationship. We can leave at any time. We can go over here if we want. If someone offends us and we don't like what they said, we can just move on. I, I, I submit to you that that's not God's plan for us in the church. It's time that we stop dating the church or living with the church and we marry the church so here at the bridge i i don't talk about this very often in fact i don't know if i've talked about it in about a year from you know in my teaching but it's something that's always in the back of my mind and it's something that we need to come to grips with from time to time as a church we need to talk about this because it is important and so today i want to give you six reasons from the scriptures why i believe every person should become a member a formally committed member of a local church. Number one, the pattern of your Bible. And what I mean by that is, what is the uniform pattern of the New Testament? I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 2. And let's take a look at this together. Here we have the day of Pentecost. The Lord raised up Peter to preach the gospel to all of the Jews assembled there. And a miraculous thing took place. The Lord moved in power and thousands of people were pricked in their hearts and they came to faith in Jesus Christ. Look at it in Acts 2 verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They, the ones that were added, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then if you skip down to verse 47, the very last sentence, And the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Now the word added comes up in two places here. Verse 41, That day there were added 
about 3,000 souls. Well, added to what? 3,000 souls were added to something. To what? They were added to the church that day. What had to precede them being added to the church? Well, they had to receive Peter's word. That means they had to receive and believe the gospel that Peter preached. Number two, they were baptized. And once they had received the gospel and had been baptized, they were added to the church. And what was their life like after they were added to the church? They were continually devoting themselves. And that's a very strong word. It means to be glued. It's like gluing two pieces of paper together. They were gluing themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were committed to Bible instruction, sharing things in common with other believers. That's what fellowship is. The Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, and praying with one another. This was what the early church life was like. Not haphazardly, not when they felt like it, not when there wasn't a football game on TV. This was their life. This is what they were committed to. And then on verse 47 says, The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So here is a prerequisite of being added to the number of the church. You have to be saved. You can't be added to the church unless you're saved. You can visit the church, but you can't be added to the church until you're regenerate, until the Holy Spirit makes you alive with Christ. Now, we find the same thing over in Acts chapter 5, in verse 14. It says there, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Well, who was added to their number? Believers in the Lord. Believers in the Lord. At the bridge, we believe in a regenerate church membership. What that means is that we cannot allow someone who's not been born again to become a member of the church because they're not a member of Christ yet. That's one of the responsibilities of the church is to try to do the best we can to discover who has been wrought upon by the grace of God, who the Lord has saved. Because in the Bible, only people who were saved were added to their number. John MacArthur has written this, And the early church coming to Christ was coming to the church. The idea of experiencing salvation without belonging to a local church is foreign to the New Testament. When individuals repented and believed in Christ, they were baptized and added to the church. More than simply living out a private commitment to Christ, this meant joining together formally with other believers in a local assembly and devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Now, I will agree that there is no specific process in the Bible of how someone makes that formal commitment to the body. There, there could be several different ways that could happen. They could indicate their commitment by signing something or by making a profession in the church meeting of some kind. And so I think it's God gives liberty to each local congregation to figure out a way of implementing how we can allow people to make that step a formal commitment but regardless of whether we have a single specific process, the, the principle of commitment to the local church is all the way through the scriptures. So that's the first reason, because of the pattern of your Bible. Because the Bible, the, the pattern of the New Testament is that each member who is saved is joined and added to a local assembly. Number two, the assurance of your salvation do you guys know that you can be sure that you're saved? That's a, a blessed thing. Uh, 1 John 5.13 says this, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. There are some Christians who believe that you really can't know whether you're saved or not. Well, here, the Bible is pretty clear, isn't it? He's writing to those who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. It is possible for us to know that we have eternal life. But having said that, I would also say this. Our level of insurance is not static, but can fluctuate 
depending upon how we are living for Christ. Now, there are three things that go into assurance of salvation. Those of you who have gone through the discipleship book probably can tell me what these are. But one is the witness of Scripture, objective promises of Scripture, like, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you trust that promise, that should give assurance. Another one is the witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, and we cry out, Abba, Father. So there's two, but there's another one, and it's the signs of life. In 1 John, one of the primary reasons he wrote this little letter is so that we could know whether we had life or not. He says that here. Um, These things I've written to you, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you are not sure, or if you lack assurance, I would encourage you to do a study of the book of 1 John and write out all of the different signs that he gives you there of eternal life. It's kind of like if you're driving down the road and you see a car that's been crashed and there's paramedics all over the place and you, you watch those paramedics and what they're doing is they're looking for vital signs to see whether that person is alive or dead. Right? They're checking for a heartbeat. They're checking for a pulse. They're trying to see if there's any brain activity. That's what we need to do if we want to see if we have been saved. Check for the vital signs of eternal life. Is God's life in you? First John tells you how you can do that. For example, one of the signs he gives us is in First John 3, verse 14. He says, We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. So let's say... You read that statement and you think, boy, I I really don't love the brethren. At least I don't love them very much. That probably is going to cause your assurance level to dip a bit because you have to deal honestly with the text. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Well, if I'm not loving the brethren, maybe I need to pray about that. Maybe I need to Ask, Lord, have, have you really saved me? And if that's so, why am I not loving the brethren? What's wrong with me? So the level of your assurance can dip according to your disobedience to the Word of God. And it can rise in, according to your obedience to the Word of God. Another one is in 1 John 3.10. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. Okay? Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Well, do I practice righteousness? That's a question that we'd have to ask ourselves. Am I practicing righteousness? Is it an overflow of the life of God that's within me? Now, when a person becomes a member of a local church, what that means is that that congregation, and especially the leaders of that church, need to be convinced that you have a credible profession of faith. What I mean by that is your profession of faith is believable. Now, if you say that you're a Christian, but you're a drunkard, or you're a drug addict, or you're living with your girlfriend, or you're living a homosexual lifestyle, or any of a number of other things, that would call into question your profession of faith, because the Bible's clear that people that live and practice those lifestyles will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It must be credible. That doesn't mean you're without sin. Nobody is. But it means that you have repented from that old life and you are striving towards holiness. God is working in you. God is sanctifying you. That's what happens to every person who's been saved. The Holy Spirit moves in and begins to sanctify them. Now, if a church can confirm and validate your profession of faith, that ought to give you a a greater level of assurance because now it's not just you saying that you're saved, but you've got a whole church that says, yeah, I think he's saved too. I can see the Lord working in his life. And that will raise the level of your assurance. And brothers and sisters, assurance is a blessing. If you have a high degree of assurance, that's a blessed thing that you shouldn't take for granted. So, number one, It's the pattern of your Bible. It's the also, uh, you should become a member of a local church because of the assurance of your salvation. And thirdly, because of the good of your church. The good of your church. 
This is one of the things that we totally overlook. And the reason is because too often we think only about ourselves. Why should you become a member of a church? Not just for your own good, but for the good of everybody else that's within that local church. Now let me try to explain what I mean. We forget that our commitment to a local church will bring will have a huge impact in the lives of other people. We affect them for good. There are about 51 another commands in the New Testament. These are commands. They're not options. They're not suggestions. These are commands to the Christian. We are to love one another, exhort one another, admonish one another, forgive one another, serve one another, restore one another, confess our sins to one another, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, accept one another, be devoted to one another, encourage one another, bear with one another, be tolerant of one another. Now, if we don't make a commitment to a local church, these one another's are not going to happen, at least not for very long. Because, well, how many of you know, how many of you are married? Just raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you that are married know that it's not always easy to be married to that person? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not always easy for our wife to be married to us. <laughs> and, I, and I'll say this, being a member of a local church is not always easy. It's easy if you just kind of slide in and sit in the back row and slip out and don't develop close relationships with other people. What happens when you get close to other people? They start to do things sometimes that rub you the wrong way. They offend you. Sometimes they may do something that hurts you. And the easiest thing is say, oh, I forget that church. I'm going to go find a church that loves me. I'm going to go down there. They have a real good church down there, right? But God has commanded us to remain in that place and to love each other and serve each other and encourage each other and not to give up doing good. God calls us to be committed, to put down roots, to be grounded in a body of believers when it's easy and when it's hard. It's just like in marriage, in sickness and in health, right? That's the way it is in a local church. A church is really to be an extended family of believers. It's not just some kind of an institution that's totally you know, abstract and impersonal. It's to be a loving family of believers. And in every family, there are squabbles, there's problems, there's difficulties. I mean, you all know this. And that, that's going to be true here. If you stay aloof, you might not have to deal with those issues. If you commit yourself and get rooted and grounded, there are going to come times when it's going to be hard to love your brother and sister. So for the good of your church, I would exhort you this morning to commit yourself to that local church. <clears throat> Did you know the Bible teaches only those who persevere to the end will be saved? Let me just substantiate that. Don't take my word for it. I'll, I'll just read uh, a couple passages. Colossians 1, verses 22 and 23. It says that He, God, has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Isn't that wonderful, beautiful promise? But you know, there's a dash... And then there's verse 23. If, <laughs> starts with that little word if, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. This is a beautiful promise, but it's a conditional promise. And the promise is that we have to continue in the faith. You can... Say, yes, I believe in Jesus. You can get baptized. You can join a church. But if at some point you walk away from the hope of the gospel, the Bible doesn't hold out any promise that you're going to be saved. Now, I don't believe that the person was saved and lost it. I believe that they never had it to begin with. Over in 1 John, it says, little children, um, I'm not going to be able to quote it, but it says that you went out from us because they were not all of us. If they were of us, they would have remained with us. So John believed that if 
a person was of the church, truly of the church, they would remain with the church. But if they walk away from Christ and the church, it's an indication that they were never really of us. So there's one. The other one I wanted to show you was from Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now here's verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So if you say, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'll say, wonderful. That is absolutely true. If you hold fast your assurance firm until the end. Don't get any crazy idea that you, you once saved, always saved. It's better once saved, always being saved. A lot of people on death row who've, who committed murder think they're going to heaven when they're executed because the, at six years old they raised their hand and walked an aisle. That's foolishness. If God has saved you, it'll manifest itself. You won't be murdering people. You won't be a criminal. You will be pursuing righteousness. You will be repenting of sin. You will be trusting Jesus because the Spirit is in you and He will make sure that happens. And He'll discipline you when you sin. So here's the principle. Only those who persevere will be saved. Now, perseverance is a community project. In other words, God isn't interested in Lone Ranger Christians. God wants a family to surround one another, to help each other persevere to the end. So that if I start to go off somewhere, or if someone else starts straying from the truth, there's a whole family that's going to go after them. There's a, there's a whole family that is going to try to bring them back. And so membership will help us persevere to the end. It's for the good of the entire church that you commit to that church, so that you will faithfully obey the one another's and those one another's include restoring someone who falls into sin let's look at number four we've seen the reason number one the pattern of your bible two the assurance of your salvation and then three the good of your church but number four is the good of your leaders the good of your leaders that's another reason to become a member of a local church it's for your leaders good let me show you that. Uh, first of all, Acts chapter 20. And I want you to think about this morning, what is the relationship between a pastor and his flock? Think about that question. Here we have, in Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders. He gathered them together because he was going to be leaving them. And he had some very important things to impart to them before he left. He never expected to see them again. And I just want you to focus in on verse 28. Paul says, be on guard to these elders. And let me just say this before we get too much further. An elder in the Bible is the same as an overseer. And that's the same as a pastor. Those are interchangeable words. So when he's talking to the elders and he tells them that they have a flock, that means they're shepherds. A shepherd is a pastor. It's the same thing. So he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What is this elder supposed to be doing? He's, he's supposed to be being on guard, number one, for himself. Number two, for all the flock. Now here's the big question. What flock? Who's in that flock? Who is he supposed to be on guard for? Is it any Christian in his city? Is it any Christian who ever visits the local church where he pastors? What if a person attends one day? Is he supposed to be on guard for that person's soul? Those are questions that need to be answered, and every pastor needs to try to figure out, okay, 
Who is the flock that the Lord wants me to be on guard for? Let's look at another one. Let's go over to 1 Peter 5. Here the Apostle Peter is addressing other elders, just like Paul addressed elders. This is Peter's address to the elders. It's 1 Peter 5, let's pick it up in verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd, or pastor, the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Now here's the little phrase I want you to think about, verse 3. Nor yet as lording it over who? Those allotted to your charge. Certain people have been allotted to your charge. That means they have been put under your specific care and responsibility. You are to watch over them. Just like each shepherd has a certain number of sheep that are in his fold, his flock, that he has to watch over. He's not responsible to watch over the sheep in somebody else's flock, right? They're the ones that are in his flock. So each pastor has certain sheep allotted to his charge. He needs to know who they are. One other passage I want to share with you is Hebrews 13, verse 17. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Okay, number one, these leaders must keep watch over certain people's souls because they're going to have to give an account. This is a verse I think about a lot. <laughs> one day I'm going to have to stand before Jesus Christ to give an account. And one of the questions he's going to ask me is, well, what did you do with those people I entrusted to you who were allotted to your charge? Did you watch over their souls? Did you? I allotted them to your charge. They were part of the flock entrusted to you. Did you watch over their souls? Were you on your guard for them? Did you let wolves come in and drag them off and do nothing about it? Or did you protect them? And did you care for them and shepherd them? So here's a question that every pastor, every leader has to face. Who are the people that God is requiring me to watch over their souls? You can help your leaders if you commit to a local church because then they know there's no guesswork anymore this person has voluntarily placed themselves under the leadership of that local church they've indicated that they're willing to follow the leadership of that shepherd um, and so now there's no guesswork okay this person it's my responsibility to watch over their soul this person has made that commitment okay they're part of the ones allotted to their charge and by the way, folks, you can't obey verse 17 unless you know who your leaders are. Because it tells every Christian that they are to obey their leaders and submit to them. Now, if you're not committed to a local church, you don't know who those people are. Is it every pastor in Sacramento that you're supposed to obey and submit to? Right? Right? Unless you're committed to a single local church, you don't have specific leaders that you can obey and submit to. That's another reason to become a committed member of a local church. Number five, the good of your world. The good of your world. And by that I mean, we've already talked about the good of the church. Now we're going to be talking about the good of non-Christians. The good of lost people. Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And I believe this is a Great Commission that is given to every Christian, not just, you know, the apostles or not just church leaders. Every Christian has a responsibility to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded in one way or another. 
Um, my question to you is, will that happen better with a Lone Ranger Christian floating around with no roots or for a person who is a committed member of a local church? Who's going to be more effective in making disciples and fulfilling the Great Commission? I would submit to you, I believe it's going to be the committed member. Number one, because in John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And the love that's going to blow people away is not just a haphazard, uncommitted, once in a while kind of love. It's, it's the kind of love that, that is committed to other people in the good times and in the bad times. It's not the, the flighty, acquaintanceship kind of love, but it is the rooted, grounded, firm commitment of believers to each other, week in and week out. Long-standing, stable, life-on-life, -life love, relationships. So that's number one. Number two, let's say you bring someone to Christ. Well, then Jesus commands you to begin teaching them to obey everything that he commanded. What kind of environment will that happen best in? If you're not committed to a local church, about the best you can say is, well, it might be a good idea for you to find a church now. If you're a member of a local church, you'll say, hey, brother, come with me. Let's go worship the Lord. And you introduce them to a, a family of God that's going to love them and care for them and obey the one another's with that person. See, the church, I look at the church as sort of a greenhouse, and we're all plants. And, and it's a greenhouse to help us grow spiritually. And so becoming a disciple inc must include involvement in a local church because that's how we grow. That's how, where we hear the Word of God preached. That's where we receive the Lord's Supper. That's where we worship and sing and praise the Lord. That's where we pray together. That's where we love each other and get to know each other. And so it's important that... If you want to be involved in reaching lost people, I, th I believe it's important that you are rooted and grounded in a local church and that you're introducing that person into a local church as a greenhouse where they can thrive and grow. Also, think about this. Whatever you model to that young believer, they're probably going to follow. So if you, fodl, if you model a non-committal kind of life, that's probably what they're going to end up doing. If you hop around from place to place, Whatever suits your fancy, they'll probably end up doing the same. And so for all of those reasons, the good of your world depends upon your commitment to a local church. Number six, the perseverance of your soul. Remember, we already talked about the fact that only those who persevere to the end are saved. And so I'm sure that means you want to persevere to the end. One of the means of perseverance is the loving discipline in the body of Christ. What if you or I happen to fall into sin? What if the devil just lays us out? What if he deceives us? What if we start walking away from the body of Christ? Don't you want somebody else to care enough about you that they're going to come after you? Like in, the, in, in a war, if somebody is wounded... The other soldiers don't just say, well, bad luck for him. we got a war to fight, <laughs> right? They send in a squadron to get those wounded people and bring them out. And the same should be true in the church. When somebody is wounded, when the devils hit somebody, we ought to be going after them. We shouldn't just ignore that, well, that's his business. That's his own private affair. No, it's not. It's your business. It's my business. It's all of our business. Let me, let me show you that. And James... Chapter 5, it's the last two verses of the book. Listen to what James says. and He's writing not to church leaders, he's writing to Christians, like us. My brethren, verses verse 19 of James 5, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. No, it's, it's not God's will that you just turn a blind eye to somebody and say, well, I guess that's his own private business. If you love him, it's your business too. And you will go to him and you'll plead with him. Come back to Christ. Come back to the body of Christ. 
Turn from that thing that so enamored you. The devil's deceiving you. Turn back to Jesus. Now, Jesus laid out specific instructions for when somebody falls into sin in Matthew 18. He said, if that happens, one of you, not two or three or not the whole church, one of you should go to that person in private and reprove them. In other words, show them the error of their way. Try to persuade them to repent and come back. If they won't listen to that one person, then that one person goes and finds one or two other people. So now two or three go to that person and they talk to them again. And they try to persuade them to repent and come back. If they won't listen to two or three, then those two or three go to the whole church and say, we've got a real problem. This brother or this sister has fallen into sin and they're not repenting. And then Jesus says, the whole church is to go after them. Now it's not two or three, it's the entire church. And so people are visiting them on their doorstep, they're calling them, they're, uh, they're emailing them, they're texting them. The whole church is going after this person. And if they still don't repent, Jesus said, then they're to be treated like a, a Gentile or a tax collector, which is basically a lost person. Because they're proving, they're evidencing by their refusal to repent that they're not a Christian. So those there are the specific instructions on how we are to restore people. If you or I are not a member of a local church and we fall and we have no root, we're not grounded in any local church, what's going to become of you in that situation? Don't you want the protection that you have shepherds and you have people that love you in a body and are willing to do what's ever necessary to bring you back against this insane decision that you've made to leave Jesus? They're going to help you and they're going to persuade you that this is not your best. It's not the best for you. God wants best for you. And I believe this only happens in committed relationships within a local church. It's for your own good. It's for the perseverance of your soul. Now, what does it look like to be a committed member of a local church? I'm just going to ask and answer a few questions as we conclude. Number one, it looks like this. It looks like that you've made a commitment to be there when the church meets. You regularly attend and you don't miss unless you're sick or you're on vacation or there's some reason why you can't make it, that, that people count on you. And when you can't be there, you let the church know. You communicate in some way or another because you're, you belong there. And people know you belong there. Number two, it means that you're committed to the mission of that church. Our mission is to make disciples that make disciples. And one of the ways we do that is through missional communities. And so to become a member of a church, if at all possible, would mean that you're a member of a missional community and that you're involved in that community making disciples. Number three, um, it would mean that you serve the body in one way or another. And you know, this last week, I just was so overjoyed to see people serving a member of our body who was sick in the hospital, very sick. People are making meals and signing up to take care of kids and fasting for her and praying for her and going to visit her. And that's what I'm talking about, serving in the body. It might mean bringing food on Sundays. It might mean, mean buying communion bread and bringing it. It might mean setting up the chairs. It might mean doing the audio visual. I mean... The sky's the limit. Let the Lord lead you and how you serve. But every person should be serving according to their gifting in one way or another in the body of Christ. And then, fourthly, it would mean investing financially in the work of God in that local church. It would mean giving. So, a member is one who attends regularly, who is involved in, in the mission of the church, making disciples, who is serving in the body, and who is giving regularly, as a minimum. Now, we're not saying how much they're supposed to give. That's up to you and the Lord. But someone who cares enough about that local church that they do give, their, their money is invested as well as their time and their energy. Let's look at another question. What should you look for in a church? And I'm just going to give you, these are my thoughts, test them against scripture. If I were looking for a local church, I would look for a church at sound and doctrine. They believe orthodox doctrine. This is going to eliminate you joining a cult. 
It's going to eliminate you joining some group that denies the Trinity or denies the deity of Christ. It's going to mean that you'll be associated with a group that believes in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So look for a church that is sound in doctrine. And if you're a brand new Christian, you might not even know what that is yet. You're going to have to figure it out. We'll help you. Hopefully we know what that means. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Number two, I would look for a church that believes and lives out the Bible. You want a church that is absolutely committed to the scriptures, that believes what this book says and is willing to do what this book says to do, even when it's hard. Now, if a church says they believe the Bible but doesn't do what the Bible says to do, then you need to question, do they really believe it? Number three, I would look for a church that loves Jesus and exalts him. It's Christ-centered. Christ is the apex of their heart's desires. They love him supremely. Their worship is all about Christ. Number four, I would look for a church that focuses on the gospel. Not some fringe thing like homeschooling or anti-abortion or anti-gay or anti-same-sex marriage. I mean, we, all of us have convictions about all of those things rooted in Scripture, but the main thing is the gospel. These other things are peripheral. It would be a church focused on the gospel. Number five, I would look for a church that is serious about the Great Commission. They're serious about it. Because that's the commandment Jesus left for the church to do. If we're not serious about that, what are we doing here? <laughs> Why do we call ourselves a church if we're not going to do what Jesus told us to do? And number six, I'd look for a church where the leadership is serious about teaching the Word of God and watching over souls. They're serious about that. They take it seriously. Another question, is it ever okay to leave a church? Is that ever okay? Well, of course it is. When we talk about making a formal commitment to a church, we're not saying that that kind of commitment is the same level as your marriage commitment. It's, it's not okay for you to leave your husband or your wife. To death do you part. <laughs> but for whatever reason, God may lead you in the future. None of us knows the future or how he's going to lead us. He may have you move to a different city. Uh, he may, your, the, the circumstances of your life may change, and you may feel a strong leading of the Lord to leave membership in one church and associate with another one. We're not saying that's not possible. We're just saying that for the time being, you are committed and rooted and grounded in a local church, and you're, you're committing yourself to that group until or unless sometime in the future God should move you on. A third question. When should I leave a local church? When should I do that? Well, there's probably lots of good answers to this question. I would say these, at least these three things. Number one, if the leaders start teaching heresy... They're teaching false doctrine which of a serious nature. You know, we all have different opinions about peripheral issues. I'm not talking about that. I'm, not, I'm talking about things that affect your salvation, things that touch on the core of the gospel. If they, if they start teaching false doctrine concerning those issues, then I would say it's time to leave. Not before you've talked with them, though, because maybe God will use you to correct them and turn them back to the truth of the Word of God. Number two... Um, if the leaders are living in unrepentant sin, maybe one of the pastors is living in adultery, uh, or he's got a secret lifestyle, or he's engaging in perpetual pornography, or, and you find out about this, and they're not repentant about it. They're not struggling against it. They're just... Li that's a no-brainer, isn't it? That's, that's a church where God cannot bless. Uh, a third one, where the church is not serious about obeying Jesus. If this is a social club, if this is just a place to come to feel good for a little while and leave, but they're not serious about following this book, I would say that's probably a time when you need to think seriously about, can I even stay there or not? Now, if you're not saved, I'm not calling you to make a commitment to the church. I'm calling you to make a commitment to Christ. That's the first order of business here. If you don't know you're saved, come to Jesus. Confess your sins. Repent of your sins. Put your trust in Jesus Christ, and He'll save you. But if you are saved, then yes, I'm exhorting you to commit. If you feel like you can't do it to the bridge, then find a church you can commit to. I, I don't think we do anyone a favor by encouraging them, them to come to this church week after week after week after week and never committing. 
because that's just encouraging them to continue on in a life of disobedience to God. I, I believe that all of us need to come to grips with the scriptures and commit ourselves to a local church. I'll conclude this morning with a quote from one of my heroes of the faith, Charles Spurgeon. He once said this, I know there are some who say, well, I've given myself to the Lord, but I don't intend to give myself to the church. Now, why not? Because I can be a Christian without it. Now, are you quite clear about that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to your Lord's commands as by being obedient. What's a brick made for? To help build a house. It is of no use for that brick to tell you that it is just as good a brick while it is kicking around on the ground as it would be in the house. It is a good-for-nothing brick. So, you rolling stone Christians, I do not believe that you are answering your purpose. You are living contrary to the life which Christ would have you live, and you are much to blame for the injury you do. Close quote. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray that you would instruct us and motivate us, inspire us, Lord, to be firmly devoted to the body that you're calling us to. That, Lord, you'd help us to be faithful within that calling. We pray that much glory would come to you. Lord, we recognize that you are doing a wonderful work here in this local church. We give you all of the glory for that, Lord. And we pray that you might use us as part of that work that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.